Welcome to LSE IQ. I'm Sue Windybank and this is the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. This month sees the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. In 1949, the Chinese Communist Party won the Chinese Civil War. Having overthrown the nationalist government of the Republic of China, Mao Zedong declared the People's Republic on October 1st in Tiananmen Square. The last 70 years have been tumultuous for China. Under Mao, it experienced economic breakdown and societal chaos. Famously, the Great Leap Forward, a campaign designed to industrialise and modernise the economy, led to the largest famine in history, with millions of people dying of starvation. And yet today, after widespread market economy reforms started by Deng Xiaoping in the 1970s, China is the second largest economy in the world. This wealth is reflected in the country's international influence, which is growing through sizeable investments the country is making in large infrastructure projects around the world. And, of course, hundreds of thousands of Chinese students study abroad every year, including at LSE. In this episode of LSE IQ, I ask, is the 21st century the Chinese century? So maybe I could put it in, in a bit of more uh, personal terms. And I was telling people when I left China in 1989, you can read newspapers for weeks without hearing anything about China. And that's completely unimaginable. Um, you know, about four decades of economic growth. And in a way that I did not expect, and I, when I was teaching, I was telling people, even Deng Xiaoping himself probably did not expect that China has leaped uh, into the world's second largest economy. Uh, it's been slowing down now for quite some time for all kinds of reasons and so on. But the economy, uh, the people, the society were fundamentally transformed. You know, um, most people like me in 1989 uh, left China having difficulty, you know, having trouble purchasing an airplane ticket because the uh, per capita per month's income, I think airplane ticket will probably require 10 months of, of income, monthly income. Yeah, I have about 100 yuan. So, yeah, that's about five or 10 months of, of income. Greeted in Mandarin in shops which accept Chinese credit. It's a welcome appreciated in high sales. The Chinese market is very, very important to us. Last year, we had about 60% of all our visitors who were international tourists, and a very significant proportion of those were Chinese. The Chinese love- now, you know, I was telling uh, people, students in my class, on Christmas, New Year holiday, Oxford Regent Street, you have these all these luxury store staff with Chinese-speaking uh, customer service people, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a huge change um, in, in all directions. I'm only giving these uh, personal uh, examples about what it was like. This is Dr. Debin Ma, Associate Professor in LSE's Department of Economic History, who spoke to us via Skype. He was recounting his personal experience of China's tremendous recent economic boom. But prior to the 19th century, China was, in fact, the world's largest economy. It was with the Industrial Revolution that a vast gap emerged between newly rich industrial nations and China. I asked Debin if there are any similarities between China's past apparent prosperity and today. It's actually, the the question itself is a bit of a myth. Because, I mean, there are people who put it in a way that China was the world's leading economy. It is definitely true. It is the largest economy. But it's the largest economy for a very simple reason, that it's the largest empire, which is about, you know, in the 18th century, was probably about 300 million people. But its per capita income was not that high. So, you know, we we don't have very good estimates for those per capita income, but they were probably lower, much lower than some of the vast countries in Europe. So um, to say it is the... and, and. I think there is all kinds of things that come out of this mess that was the, was the, it was the world's largest economy. Hence, what China is doing is restoring itself to the, you know, to the historical position. And that's, that's really not true. After Mao's death in 1976 and the struggle for power, Deng Xiaoping rose to become the preeminent leader in the Chinese Communist Party. 
He is sometimes called the architect of modern China because of his landmark economic reforms, which began in 1978. The Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy was being threatened by concerns about the country's ability to feed its own people and the growing economic gap between China and its East Asian neighbours, whose success China studied and, to a certain extent, was to emulate. When China was to a certain degree, closed off in the 1950s or turned towards the Soviet Union for a while. Um, There was Japan in the 1950s. There was Taiwan. There was Hong Kong. So it's a very interesting comparison. Japan was a defeated country after the Second World War. The city was bombed. Its economy was in complete shambles. We all knew that that was the case, and people were completely impoverished. Uh, by 19, late 1970s, Japan emerged as one of the highest developer countries. So that was quite a bit of a shock. But what was also even more shocking was the case of Taiwan, right? This is the place where the nationalists uh, ran to after being defeated by the, by the communists, and they were really losers. Again, by 19, late 1970s, 1980s, they built a very vibrant economy. Uh, Hong Kong was a British colonial territory. And it stayed as a, as a colonial territory, partly by accident. And for a long time, in the 1920s and 30s, you know, Hong Kong was sort of a, a cousin, you know, a young cousin to Shanghai. Every time Shanghai was in trouble, the capital would go there, and then, then it became less important. And then suddenly, by the late 1970s, 1980s, Hong Kong was becoming a major, major financial center. It was per capita income except exceeding mainland China. By several times, or even exceeding, you know, the colonial masters in this case, the British. So, so all these things are really huge shock. That um, and all of these territories, you know, Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, later on turn out to be not just examples, but they turn out to be major nodes of transfer of technology, uh, personnel, and capital. Taiwan and Hong Kong, of course, share a common heritage with China. All are cultures shaped by the teachings of the 4th century philosopher Confucius, who emphasised, among other things, filial piety, respect for authority, and knowing one's place in society. But for Debin, it's the differences between them that should be valued. In the late 1970s, the Chinese economy could grow much more quickly because the Chinese civilization had seen variations in the case of Taiwan, in the case of Hong Kong. And that really showed the real possibilities. And these possibilities were very important to act as a stimulus for change within China. And and I think today, I think the lesson is still important that I think the real fear was with the one country, two system, the idea of Hong Kong is becoming increasingly like mainland China. Without that particular variation, the Chinese civilization or even the long term prospect may well become, you know, uh, st- probably uh, stagnant in that, in that respect. So I think in, this might be a this might be a relevant call that, you know, the, the case of ta- the case of differentiation within Chinese civilization, certainly in the case of Taiwan, in the case of Hong Kong, were probably a strength rather than something, you know, the Chinese government need to worry about all the time. In other words, to keep them distinct and and is actually beneficial for the for the Chinese economy. And distinct politically, institutionally, or even to some degree culturally may be beneficial for the Chinese economy and the uh, Chinese, you know, Chinese state in the long run. Through continuing economic reform at home and opening up to the global economy in the 1990s, China's GDP grew to 13.6 billion US dollars in 2018. Today, China is both the world's largest manufacturing economy and exporting nation. Importantly, China's prosperity has lifted millions of its people out of poverty. The IMF estimates that when purchasing power is taken into account, China's GDP per capita was just over the equivalent of 18,000 US dollars in 2018. However, having experienced double-digit percentage growth, China's economy has been slowing 
down to 6.2% in the second quarter of 2019. China reports its slowest growth rate for nearly three decades. The trade war with America. What does it mean for the rest of the world? China has been the economic miracle of recent decades, but is it running out? I think China has been growing a double digit and for the last uh, three decades, it's been slowing down. That's not something that actually um, concerns me personally. I, I do think there's emphasis towards the quality of the growth. Um, and there is a certain segment of the Chinese population have gotten very wealthy, as we talked about, you know, these shoppers and, and also investors and so on. But that doesn't speak for the whole of China, you know, and China still uh, depends on how you measure it. It's very much a, a developing economy. It's, it's highly unbalanced uh, in many ways. So the growth potential remains huge um, in, in many ways. But whether or not it will continue to grow, it depends so much on, in my views, down the road, the political factors that really become very, very important. It's a vast country. This is where the strength is. But it could also pose a huge problem with, you know, you, you try to control a territory with, with very relatively uniform policies. I think one of the issues that really, really um, became quite important as economic growth continues down the road is that when Chinese economy was very poor, the first desire is just to grow rich. So you everything just put aside and the desire was relatively uniform. You just want to have a bit more money in a pocket. You were able to eat better, you know, dress better and um, sleep better and so on. But when the economy was growing, when going beyond a level, and this is where I think the real quality actually comes from diversity, right? How uh, people feel their, their wishes being accomplished, um, how things, not just the food and clothes, but other things such as cultural products, such as the idea that I have much more control over my life. Can I realize my dream? Uh, can I do something different from, you know, uh, from my parents' generation? So which means one of the things that China needs to learn how to manage is manage this particular diversity, recognizing that diversity is crucial to the quality of economic growth down the road. And if you're worried about this diversity eroding, you know, controlling whatever way, and I think that's where the trouble could really come in. And that's where I think there will be upper limit to how far really the um, Chinese economy could go. Dr. Yu Jia is a senior research fellow at Chatham House, focusing on Chinese foreign policy and economic diplomacy. She's also an associate at LSE's international think tank, LSE Ideas, she set out the challenges that she sees facing China's economy, raising the issue of China's focus on companies owned by the state at the expense of those owned privately. Well, I have to say the economy is not in a good state as everyone was hoping for to have the double digit growth every year. And then there's still some sense of unfair competition between the state-owned enterprises vis-a-vis -vis private enterprises because state-owned enterprises is taking all the financial resources but creating the least productivity and least tax revenue, whereas the private enterprise is contributing half of the Chinese tax revenue and 80% of total employment. And that, the, but however, they have never on a fair competition. And what are the threats to Chinese economic growth? several things in here. So the most obvious one would be the uncertainty regarding trade war. Even though Chinese economy has tried very hard to try to build itself as being consumption-led economy, but nevertheless, we, we still have to admit 40% of the Chinese export are made from private enterprises. So the economy are largely affected by export and import, and the United States being one of the largest trade partners with China. So the uncertainty hangs there. And the second uncertainty is on this, I said it earlier, the unfair competition between the private enterprises vis-a-vis -vis the state-owned enterprises and how much confidence, how much business confidence the private company would have to its own party. And the last one would be on the environmental issue because Xi Jinping has offered a very strong message since he came to power saying, I'd like to have a 
I would like to make China become greener, and I would like to make the air in China become much cleaner. Yes, that's all very well, but that would have a big economic implication as well. That means the economics will slow down for the sake of satisfying the environmental criteria. So that's another dilemma for the party in here to decide finally how far they would like to go to get the balance right. So for the Chinese economy, for the slowdown, is always moving two steps ahead and uh, step one step behind. I happen to think that tariffs for our country are very powerful. You know, we're the piggy bank that everybody steals from, including China. For Debin Ma, the threat the US-China trade war poses is about more than economics. We all know very, very clearly, US was China's largest market. So any type of tariffs uh, imposed on Chinese factories is going to have huge impact on domestic production uh, inside China. But this is also, we all know, this is not just a trade war anymore, right? This is about political war, security war. Uh, you're talking about, you know, the banning of Huawei and all those things. So it's really impacting the global uh, value chain. But the trade war is actually much deeper. It's going back to history. It gets into the psyche of the whole thing. Because one of the big problems with Chinese reform was that being a very large country, uh, sticking to certain political regime, there was an internal inertia uh, that would go against the reform. So like before, but of course in a very, very different way, trade and uh, investment and institution acted as a certain kind of discipline advice, the device for China, that you, if you have foreign factories come in, you have to do it according to certain international standard and practice, which means certain rule of law had to be put. That created a lot of stability across the board. And that's something very important. The other element, of course, is bringing technology, personnel. And um, so what really is very, very important, perhaps from people from outside didn't recognize the trade war is the specter was more hunting than uh, than just the trade. What China feared the most was with the tariffs, with the closing down, it will, that China will be turning, ended up be, being turned to or turning itself um, into a closed country, which you had seen in 18th century China, which you were being cut off. And you saw that a little bit in 1950s, 1960s, China was cut off. Then what you had is complete technological stagnation. But not only that, there's really no countervailing power against the completely misguided policies. So I think to a certain degree, that is something much more important. I think there's actually uh, forces inside China that were pushing for China to have a trade agreement and to make China much more open with or without threats. And I think... You know, unfortunately, with Donald Trump's very nationalist rhetoric, you know, the you know he's not joining these forces at all. But I think it is important for the for the external world to recognize that there is the, that there is forces inside, probably certainly inside the Chinese government, realizing that there are a lot of benefits China could gain from being open and 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 being closed off, particularly if China closes off by itself, and that is potentially quite dangerous down the road. China may not want to be isolated economically, but in other ways, it is quite happy to stand apart from the rest of the world and the liberal international order. Christopher Coker is Professor of International Relations and Director of LSE Ideas. And in his new book, The Rise of the Civilizational State, he sets out how China is reinventing itself as a distinctive civilization with its own values and history. The Chinese Communist Party is facing the dilemma that it has achieved a remarkable economic growth, but that nobody actually believes in communism. Uh, That there is, in other words, a moral vacuum at the heart of Chinese society, that young people need something uh, in order not to be rapacious, to screw each each other over for a percentage, to uh, forge ahead, creating uh, economic and social inequalities that would be very difficult for any state to deal with, even the present one in China. And so they have gone back to Confucianism, uh, which dates back at least over 2,000 years and is uh, the oldest uh, moral value uh, philosophical system uh, in Chinese history. So China is now, according to Xi Jinping, its leader, a Leninist Confucian state. And he spends uh, every year 
going to Confucius's birthplace to pay his respects. He insists that party members read Confucian texts. Confucian texts, which used, of course, to be denounced by Mao Zedong and communists back in 1949 as having set back the country for centuries, are now actually required reading in schools. The West has, at least historically, been in the business of trying to export its values, of course, um, rule of law, human rights, press freedoms. Is China interested in exporting its values in the same way, or is this promotion of China as a unique civilization more a vanguard against Western liberal democracy? Well, one uh, feature of a civilizational state is that it claims uh, to cite Xi Jinping's own phrase that he uses over and over again, harmony with coexistence. In other words, every civilization should respect the values of every other civilization. Uh, they are not there to export their values or their way of life. Uh, Xi Jinping would also argue that civilizational states like China have never done imperialism. They have no civilizing mission. Uh, they have no human rights agenda, for example, which they want to impose on the world often by force, by regime change and nation building, which as we've seen has had disastrous results in parts of the world like Iraq. So that is very much uh, a principle in their case. Don't uh, interfere in our internal affairs and we won't uh, interfere in yours based on what they would claim to be mutual respect for each other value systems. So they're not going around saying that liberalism is wrong for the West but they're saying that it has no place in China and a great many other countries as well. This is not to say that China does not have international ambitions. These are manifested in its Belt and Road Initiative, a kind of 21st century Silk Road to improve China's connections across the globe by funding and building infrastructure projects in more than 78 countries. Confusingly, the belt of the Belt and Road is made up of infrastructure developments which support overland road and rail routes. And the road actually refers to projects related to sea routes. Yuja explained more. The Belt and Road Initiative was introduced by President Xi from 2013, which is to use China's expertise in building infrastructures to connect from China to the rest of the world. So it covers more than 70% of world population and 60% of the world GDP. And all sound very well. And to some extent, it's a part of China's neighborhood diplomacy because China is sharing border with 17 different countries and China have to make sure its neighbors happy in order to facilitate its own domestic growth. So that's from geopolitical and geoeconomic point of view is China's foreign policy agenda in the future decade. And also from a domestic angle, which angle has largely, largely been ignored by the Western politics, which is also try to even the gap, be, the gap of development between the coastal provinces of China and the Western inland provinces of China. Because as what we have witnessed so far, most of the strong infrastructure connected with the Belt and Road Initiative are built in the Western provinces of China, not in the East, which is trying to even the income and inequalities between the two parts of the country. There's been some accusations that China's interest in some of these countries and projects is actually about pursuing a neo-colonial agenda, creating lopsided trade agreements and trapping countries in debt. Is that fair? I think to some extent it is fair. Because what we have acknowledged in here, what China has done so far with the Belt and Road Initiative, it is very similar to the Marshall Plan back to the end of the Cold War, uh, sorry, the end of the Second World War. And what America is trying to do is for, try to use the enormous financial resources, exert influence in the Europe. So what China's trying to do is trying to exert its own influence to the neighboring countries. Um, but on the other element of, for this is, most of the countries who are willing to join China's Belt and Road Initiative, they are already in a very fragile financial state. And which means they do not really have a sufficient capacity or capability to borrow money from traditionally Washington consensus-led institutions such as IMF and World Bank. So China become an alternative of borrowing uh, for those countries. So on the one hand, yes, China may practice that sense of so-called colonial um, or debt trap diplomacy. But on the other hand, there's a demand and supply issue. I think the demand is there for those countries to borrow money from China. So I think it's, it's a two-way game. It's, it's very 
it's very tricky to blame whose fault is this. For example, if we look at Pakistan, which is you know long-standing ally for China, but Pakistan, Pakistan has always had an issue with the IMF in terms of debt. So there's nothing new. Christopher Coker is more cynical about China's intentions. The Belt and Road Initiative has been characterised as a trade initiative, a means to stimulate China's economy and a soft power initiative. Is there a military aspect to China's ambitions there? Well, I think there's always a military aspect to, to much soft power. Soft power is often underwritten by military power or if soft power could lead to military power. So, for example, the Chinese are, uh, were, indeed are, uh, building um, a base in um, a port, I should say, in Sri Lanka, which is costing the Sri Lankan government about 73% of all government revenue every year simply to pay back the debt. It's called debt entrapment, that you persuade people to sign contracts and then they find that they're completely committed uh, and unable to get out of the contracts that they've signed and that you actually then can repossess much of the equipment that you've sold and the port is yours, it's no longer Sri Lanka's. Similar ports in Gwandor and Pakistan, uh, which is in a sense, I think, a naval base that's been mothballed for the moment because the Pakistanis are also beginning to question their close embrace with China, as many other countries are. Malaysia uh, is another. So yes, the uh, Great Belt and Road Initiative is indeed soft power, but it has a hard edge to it. If you default on your loans, the Chinese will come in and own what they've built for you. And a port can become a naval base pretty quickly. Now your 2015 book is entitled The Improbable War, China, the United States and the Logic of Great Power Conflict. Is war between the US and China improbable? A war between great powers we have thought was improbable since 1910, when a famous book was published by Norman Angel called The Great Illusion, in which he argued that not that great powers would not go to war against each other in the future, but that they would be very foolish to do so, since none of them would come out of it uh, the richer, in fact many would come out of it the poorer. And in fact, uh, if you look at 20th century history, you'll see that with the single exception of the United States, that did extremely well out of the Second World War and emerged the superpower that it still is today, every other power was pretty much ruined financially and uh, economically more generally by war. That argument hasn't gone away. In fact, we've had it, uh, we've heard it since the 1850s. Uh, political economists arguing that free trade is the best way to enrich yourself. War is the quickest route to financial and economic ruin. Most people subscribe, I think, to that idea, and so they think that on the basis of rationality, neither China nor the United States would wish to go to war against each other. Tariff wars are something quite different, of course. But the problem is, as I try to show in my book, uh, human rationality is very faulty, and we are all subject to certain social psychological flaws, one of which uh, we academics call cognitive dissonance, that you always m perhaps misunderstand or misread other people's intentions. Uh, and in fact, uh, history suggests that you it's safer to misread them uh, and to think that they have uh, some rather nasty intentions against you than it is to deceive yourself into thinking that they're nice and find out the hard way when it's too late, but they're not. Confirmation bias is another social psychological flaw. That means that uh, because you can't find evidence of someone's bad intentions, you just know that they've hidden them more successfully uh, than you had a first thought. In other words, we are a, a species that tries to get into the minds of other people and read their motives. We have a theory of the mind, uh, as uh, biologists uh, tell us, but we often misread motives. We're not quite as clever as we think. And therefore, uh, yes, you could have a war between the United States and China, and it would probably be occasioned by mischance, mishappens, uh, accident perhaps, an incident between two warships at sea, which could easily escalate Escalation being another factor, of course, which explains why great powers go to war against each other. But above all, I think the important thing with a great power, unlike a small power, is it has a reputation to protect. Uh, we call this uh, credibility. And when credibility is on the line, countries can come out firing. Uh, when the United States' credibility was on the line in 9-11, uh, the US spent $3.5 trillion getting its credibility back. It's called the War on Terror and it's still going on almost 20 years later. I asked Christopher what could be the potential drivers for conflict between China and the United States. 
He raised the issue of Hong Kong and the potential for China to crack down on the pro-democracy protests which began in June. If that happens, of course, they'll abrogate the treaty that they signed in 1997. So the whole idea of having two systems in one country uh, will go out of the window and Hong Kong will be forcibly, I think, incorporated uh, fully into China. That means Taiwan is next. Uh, and if you reject the idea of two systems in one country, then you reject the idea of the peaceful unification of China, which leaves you with a forcible reunification of China, something which I think the party has been absolutely committed to, though not uh, perhaps for the next 10 years or so. I think we may see the timetable being changed quite significantly. And at the moment, um, the Americans are telling themselves, if you read quite clearly what they're saying in the uh, specialist literature, is that their aircraft carriers uh, can't defend uh, Taiwan. Indeed, it may be too dangerous to even deploy their aircraft carriers in the South China Seas, since they can't uh, defend themselves against the anti-ship missile systems which the Chinese now have, which means that the Americans can't actually defend Taiwan. That doesn't mean that they will necessarily accept the forcible integration of Taiwan. It just means that they will try to resist in other areas and other theaters of operations. And that's how wars usually begin, a local incident uh, escalates into a global affair. And China has, at least in terms of personnel, um, the biggest military in the world, I think. But this isn't surely just a defensive force. No, it's there to keep the regime in power. Uh, the Chinese army is not much shakes, uh, quite frankly. Uh, if you're looking at the most impressive part of the Chinese military, it's the Navy. And they'll get their second aircraft carrier quite soon. They intend to um, show the flag, uh, as Western navies have been doing um, for a couple of centuries. They can, I think, successfully contest American naval power west of Hawaii. I think the intention is to drive the American navy back to Hawaii where of course it was when the Japanese arrived in 1941 in Pearl Harbor. Their intention is to shut down American military bases in East Asia. Their intention is to break the American alliance systems with countries like South Korea and the Philippines. In the case of the Philippines, they may already have done that, in fact. And to do this peacefully, of course, through diplomacy, uh, through economic diplomacy, through loans, uh, massive infrastructure projects, etc., etc. The um, Army is essentially a, a police force um, and a very corrupt force uh, as well. The Space Command is extremely important because of anti-satellite systems. The cyber warriors are extremely important. The Chinese are probably the best people at cyber warfare in the world today. The other country would probably be Russia and the United States would be third on the list. Um, and economic, uh, of course, warfare as well, which would put uh, tariffs that we see today in, in the shade. There are many forms of economic warfare and information warfare as well. So interfering in elections, undermining your own credibility in the eyes of your own people, etc., etc. I think the Chinese have much more chance of being successful there against the United States than the Americans have of being successful against them, precisely because China is now a surveillance, social totalitarian society where it's very, very difficult for citizens to get information. I asked you, Je, what it is that motivates China. What would you say it's important for us in the West to understand about China and the Chinese Communist Party to un help un us understand her foreign policy? Uh, that's a very good question, because at the end of the day, um, the Chinese foreign policy, the origin of the Chinese foreign policy, and also the main sources of Chinese foreign policy, uh, all come back from the Chinese domestic politics, which is operated by this one party state. And then um, the Communist Party itself has changed for so many times since 1921 and up until now. And we're now having, by 2021, we're going to have the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party. And this is a party has changed, I would say, at least three or four times historically to make itself would survive from all the controversies and turbulence China as a state suffered in the past. Um, however, in the eyes of the many Western political pundits or governments, by having one party, which means is your authoritarian regime, and for a stop. Yes, indeed, absolutely, China, it is authoritarian regime. 
but this authoritarian regime has a very quick learning, learning curve to change itself. I'll give you an example. Um, for what we were talking about, you know, Xi Jinping are unwilling to make compromises, and he seems to be one of the strongest leaders for China as his chairman now. And what happened on the Belt and Road Initiative so far is Xi Jinping actually addressed the criticisms from the West regarding the debt trap issues and also regarding also financially and sustainability issues. So that's a way of making compromises and to some extent to show the party are willing to make compromises, but only to the extent which is not threatening the ruling of the Chinese Communist Party. So I think every time when we begin to analyze the Chinese foreign affairs, and we should look at into to what extent this foreign policy go will help the Chinese Communist Party to strengthen its own rules back home. So the party is very good at telling a story on each section of the population it would like to hear. I mean, for example, back to 1949, the message for the party was we kept away um, the foreigners, um, China or Chinese population no, no longer suffered from foreign bullying. And by 1979, the story is all about the party will make every single household getting richer. And now by 2019, this whole notion of China dream is to make China great again. I mean, it might sound familiar, but that seems to be in the heart of many Chinese population nowadays. Given its focus on domestic audiences, is China even interested in becoming the world's leading power beyond economic might? Going back to my initial question, I asked Yu Jia whether the 21st century is set to be the Chinese century. Well, we can't say 100% the century would belong to China or belongs to any other country, but we can certainly see a political system somehow, hopefully, would be coexist together with the democratic party, uh, democratic system we have in the West. Because ultimately, I think both system, irrespective of which system you are, is the governmental accountability to its own people which matters. And I think that's a challenge, that's a common challenge, not just for the West in here, I mean, for example, the Brexit and also the populism um, around this, this part of the world, but it's also for the Chinese for the Chinese government, ultimately, how much trust they can build to its own people. Um, until then, we don't know who would own 21st century. And ultimately, I would say, the better case scenario would be a peaceful coexistence between the authoritarian regime, a benevolent authoritarian regime, vis-a-vis -vis the representative democracy in the West. And the worst case scenario might be something Ransom Allison had predicted, the ultimate unavoidable war between China and the United States. But I think the second scenario is very unlikely, given how intertwined we are for the world nowadays. Here's Christopher Coker. No, I don't think the 21st century is any uh, country's century. We got into this game, I think, in the 18th century, which we often call the French uh, century because of the European Enlightenment and the great uh, French philosophers like Voltaire, uh, and um, so-called French, but he was Swiss Rousseau. We talked about the 19th century being the British century because we provided all the, the engineers, uh, the people who built all the railways across the world, and we owned all the banks and financial services, and the American century, of course, was the 20th century. I don't think any country, even China, is large enough to dominate the 21st century, and it may well be that no nation state is going to dominate. It may well be that corporations dominate. Maybe that the kind of companies we see, like Apple and others, on a much, much bigger scale, when we get into the trillion dollars and not the billion dollars, I mean, we're about to create our first trillionaire quite soon, the first in history. These people may be, and these organizations, may be far more powerful than nation states. But we must remember one thing, that only for the foreseeable future can the nation state or the civilization state produce another great power war. And we have seen the problems associated with the war on terror, the cost of it in human life and in treasure, but that is nothing compared to another great power war that can do infinitely more damage. Every great power war in the last 200 years has been worse than the last. 
And it is quite possible that if you had a war between the United States and China, which ended with attack on one's satellite systems in order to blind one's forces, which are totally reliant on them, you would see the creation of so much space debris up there in space that it would become commercially unviable for the next hundred years, which means setting back the world economy back to the 1950s, if you're lucky. And that is not a very happy prospect. That would actually be to greater economic damage than any world war ever has. It's only taken us four years to bounce back from each world war back to where we were before economically because we're very resilient and very robust. But if the satellites go down, that's a completely different situation. And finally, Debbie Ma reflected on the vastly different histories of China and Europe and what this might tell us about the future. So if you think about most Europeans or Western European are the descendants of the Roman Empire, which collapsed around, you know, whatever, 280 or something. Or, you know, I was looking at it, that's about the same time as the Hong Chinese Empire that collapsed. But the thing that was very interesting, the Chinese Empire uh, regrouped and uh, reunified. So it stayed within one empire. So if you're really looking at that perspective, uh, what you see is that in the last few centuries, with the uh, Industrial Revolution, with colonization, this discovery of the new world, is the sp- spread of the descendants of the Roman Empire, of that particular civilization. And in particular, with English language becoming the world's, uh, you know, almost a universal language. And China was very interesting because I don't have the exact figures because there are, there are probably more Chinese people speaking Chinese than English, right? Just, but it was very different. The most, most, you know, Chinese are spoken by Chinese only. That's not true with English. English are spoken by, you know, non-English native speakers. And so the, in the case of England, there's a spread of civilization, the institution and in the, in the culture, and they're spread over several continents. Where in the case of China, they were all cooped up in, in one, uh, you know, basically one country. Now, if that potential was unleashed, now this is talking about real history, and uh, even if China achieving whatever, you know, half of the European level, you will really to see the impact. So um, how they will, that will contribute to the world of civilization. And, you know, to a certain degree, you think of the European and English civilization, you know, the, it's controversial, but in many ways defining the modern world is, is are the Chinese able to bring uh, something to the table? Not just economically, you know, economically is, is of course, one thing. But um, but you will see, I think, when they grow economically, whether or not it will it will have the kind of a cultural resource to make us rethink about how the world was re- restructured. Uh, so if that's the case, we will see a different kind of world that was emerging, coming out of century long of different trajectory of uh, of um, uh, evolution. And indeed, you know, maybe you could call that you know, if the earlier one was the European century. Uh, uh, there could be a Chinese century, or uh, and, uh, like the European or the English century, it's not just European and English anymore. They are becoming part of the human civilization, and I think that's what hopefully the Chinese century was also part of the, uh, you know, human century or human civilization that that contribute for the for the better betterment uh, to some degree. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode of LSEIQ was produced by Ollie Johnson, James Ratti, and myself, Sue Windybank. Want to explore more about the rise of China? This episode was based in part on the following research. Christopher Coker, The Improbable War. China, the United States, and the Continuing Logic of Great Power Conflict. Published by Oxford University Press. The Rise of the Civilizational State by Christopher Coker published by Polity Press. From Divergence to Convergence, re-evaluating the history behind China's economic boom, the Journal of Economic Literature by Lauren Brandt, Debin Ma and Thomas G. Worski. And One Belt, One Road, A Reality Check, LSE Ideas Strategic Update by Yu Zhe. For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSEIQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.